Black liberation theology into its organizational structure and doctrines. With that, uh, to, yeah, basically now I would like to welcome the PM to start the debate from the opening half. Hey, here. Um, I would prefer my POIs to be verbal, by the way. I won't see it if it's on camera, and I also probably won't see it if it's in the chat. Cool. Black churches occupy a sacred space in the minds of most people because we think that it is a space that was respected by all as a place for safety, for unity, and for harmony. There is a reason why MLK became the leader of the civil rights movement. The fact that he was a pastor is a critical factor because it meant people were willing to be more accepted, more open to his ideas, and people within his movement were able to benefit from the energy and the positive um, liberation theory that he brought. What exactly do we think that this motion looks like? We think we are happy to platform pastors and preachers in when they're speaking about um, Black Lives Matter. We are also um, happy to make explicit references to the Bible and reference previous biblical stories about people being freed from oppression, for example, with Moses. So we'll be bringing you two main arguments today. Firstly, on this idea of cohesion, and secondly, on why we think we are more likely to get change and buy-in. Firstly, then, on, the, on cohesion. The premise of this argument is that we think existing people in the movement are likely to be happier. They are more likely to see the movement as a safe space, and they are much more likely to be confident in fighting for their rights, which we think is critical for the sustainability of the movement. When people are willing to keep coming back, when people are not satisfied with minor changes because they think that it has been dealt with as the new political issue of the day, when it sticks much more as a central core value that they care about. Why exactly do we think it's true? We think particularly for Black Christians, we think firstly, they're much more likely to see it as a positive and welcome space when it aligns with the values that they hold so closely and so dear to the hearts, when it is something that they can buy into on an intuitive level and don't have to do much thinking about, when on an emotional basis, it just appeals to their sense of safety. But secondly, we think um, we think the Christian narrative is also critical for these cases. The idea of inevitability and the basic optimism that underlies a lot of Christian sentiments, the idea that you are working towards a God-given aim and that you will get there because God is on your side. We think that is critical so that these movements are not going to be buffeted against any sort of resistance and they're much more likely to fight and understand that what they're doing is leading towards possibly incremental changes but changes nonetheless. We think this is also critical given how much doubt and anxiety exists in the status quo. When people are told that yes black on um, black people do for example face rates of over policing but let's talk about black on black violence isn't that more of an issue you're not really oppressed you're bringing these issues on yourself. When people are also told that yes some people are victims of police brutality but let's bring up the criminal charges that they've had against them in the past. When you hear all these narratives that try to undercut the basic premise of what you're doing, that regardless of those cases, there are structural reasons as to why these people are much more likely to suffer violence, much more likely to suffer police brutality. The absolute sense of justice that Christianity almost uniquely pushes and that secular values don't do as much, we think is critical for them being um, for, for them being able to be confident and be confident in their movement and their value in speaking out. But we think that atheists and other people and people from other religions in this movement are also likely to benefit. Atheists, for example, are likely to benefit from that same energy because even if you don't believe that an absolute truth comes from God, you probably do believe in there being better values and better moral values than not. And we think being surrounded by other people with that conviction is critical for your own sense of security as well. And we think that people from other religions are likely to integrate into this movement well. We think that ideas of openness and acceptance and tolerance are also key parts of Christianity. For example, this is why um, MLK was able to like work with the Muslim Brotherhood during the civil rights movement. The impact of this then is that we make the BLM movement more than a movement. We make it something that you can tie your collective sense of identity to. It is something that you keep coming back to instead of the new political issue of the day. It is something that you are going to constantly fight for and constantly act for changes on. Secondly, then, on why we think we're much more Do likely. I see you. Um, sure, I'll take you now. Um, I don't know what church you're talking about that's so open and wholesome, but mostly they have been unwilling to cooperate with vast majority of groups that they don't align with. What does that mean for the future of BLM? We're most likely to be talking about churches nowadays because they have to accept that, that there are other religions that people work with that there are lots of more people are becoming atheists have to sort of mainstream themselves and become more tolerant and accepting in order to align with those values yes there are some more fringe churches that are actively hostile towards other people we just think that because there's a small subsection of churches that's probably not who we're talking about so secondly then why we think we're much more likely to get changed the premise of this argument is that we're not saying we're going to fix everything obviously not everyone is going to become an ardent blm supporter but we do think some people will change and we are much more likely to to firstly reduce active opposition towards the BLM movement and secondly create more positive feelings and associations with them. Four mechanisms for why 
and this is true. Firstly, that we increase buy-in, particularly because in the status quo, change tends to be concentrated in more urban, more liberal areas like New York, like states like California. We think on our side of the house, when you those tends, those also tend to be places with fewer concentrations of religious people. On our side of the house, we are more likely to cater to older people, conservative people, people who live in the South where the Black church is much more spread out and has much more strong spheres of influence. We think when we are able to enter their sphere and breach them through whatever it is, through their church, through their social media feeds, through um, whatever sources of information they get, we are much more likely to expose them to these ideas on a fair basis and they're able to hear it directly from the source. We also think that, the, oh, sorry, secondly then on why we think we are also likely to cater to conservative white people. Because when the status quo, there is a lot of stigma against the BLM movement, stigma is that this is an inherently violent movement. We think we are able to change that when we show that even if there are some subsections of BLM that are violent, the essential tenant of their of that movement is that they have the moral high ground. They are fighting for, they are fighting for liberation and as a result, they align with all the Christian values. We think having those common values is critical because everyone has differences in their lives. The issue is some people see differences as more important and some people see differences as not that important. Some differences allude to how like human you are and how deserving you are of rights and some differences don't, which is why you get a lot less discrimination for like what type of job you have versus the color of your skin. When you're able to see beyond that and not see not just a lack of stigma, but an active bond because you agree on the basic tenets of your life and the basic morals that you want to abide with. We think on our side of the house, you're much more likely to get people to, oh, to see differences in the color of your skin and race and where you come from as significantly less important as the thing that you have decided to devote your life to and build your life and your morals and happiness around. Thirdly, then, we also think we are simply going to get more spread. We think, for example, when you're able to, um, sorry, for example, when you're able to um, penetrate like religious newsletters, we also think that you know don't just give this idea that this is a good movement, but you're also able to underscore the sense of duty. Not only am I not opposed to BLM, but because this is critical to Christianity, because liberating people from oppression is an essential part and an impetus that I have. It is not just I'm okay with it and I won't oppose it, but this is something that I act actively have to buy into because it gives me a sense of duty. Because not acting on this means me means I'm negligent and means I'm not fulfilling out God's fulfilling and pursuing God's purpose. And lastly, then that we think that religion is a uniquely good sphere to have it. Politics is increasingly polarized in the United States. A lot of people are willing to make assumptions based on what party you want, based on what like division you come from. As a result, we think religion is uniquely good because people associate religion, particularly religious people, associate religion with being more empathetic. They're significantly more receptive to ideas that are phrased in the language that they are comfortable in, the language that they automatically listen more to from their pastors. As a result, we think they're much more likely to be less hostile and open their minds. Why is this critical? Firstly, because we simply think that increasing the number of supporters you get is critical for all the future movements. All future movements that rely on things like like referenda, like voting, like attending rallies and um, like it's attending rallies and protests. Our movement is significantly more sustainable. It is not a flare up. It is a, uh, you're able to long-term increase your political capital. We are also critically able to remove active opposition because when it's no longer beneficial for politicians to repeatedly characterize BLM as a bad thing because they know that they will get backlash from it, we're able to increase BLM support inside, outside, and forever. Thank you for that speech. I now welcome, hello. Uh, can you please confirm that I'm audible? Yep, you're audible to me. Let me just set up my timer and take a sip of water. Right. I'm going to start in three, two, one. I gotta love it when prime minister gives me an introduction which proves why their entire case is uncomparative. We can use religion on our side of the house and we already do. Not that a huge amount of all black organizations and charities already go through their church, especially in places where there are all black churches, for example, Charleston, Alabama. Not that secondly, black pastors all across the south have been speaking out in support of blm and using the language of liberation theology already particularly because a large amount of them were inspired and directly walk in the tradition of reverend martin luther king who used that same rhetoric and this is something that their congregation believes in and this is used to retain support within their congregation thirdly a large amount of organizations exist which are actively affiliated with blm like the southern christian liberation conference founded by martin luther king we already have churches holding Black Lives Matter events. But lastly, if people find solace in liberation theology, I'm sure they can read those works and get inspired by it anyway. Given all of these things, and if there is no active opposition between liberation theology and BLM, I'm actively unsure why opening government requires this motion to get any of their benefits. It's largely symmetrical. The second problem with opening government is that they have no stance on what liberation theology actually entails. And this is what our first argument is going to be about. 
So the use of liberation theology simply makes the BLM movement less palatable. Because what does it entail? One, it entails elements of economic Marxism, the idea of radical redistribution found within the Bible. But secondly, more importantly, the idea that the values of Christianity, the idea of love thy neighbor, has been actively corrupted by the majority white population, and therefore only struggle and resistance is the way to return to the core of Christianity. Even though we in this room may agree with this idea, this means that white individuals are likely to say that's a bastardization of Christianity, something that directly goes against God's word, specifically in the Bible Belt, right? We see most of the discrimination and most of the conservative people that are acting out against black individuals where you need the most change that open government wants. Even Barack Obama got lambasted for going to sermons of Jeremiah Wright because he espoused these ideas of liberation theology and because they were seen as going against American identity. Unluckily, most American politicians are not one of the most charismatic politicians in the history of the US going against a fucking dumb candidate. So this is, li this is likely to hurt political cooptation of the BLM movement in a large amount of cases because association with liberation theology makes the movement seem less palatable, first of all, in terms of ideas inherently seen as dangerous in America. The idea of radical redistribution, which seems to interfere with the idea of liberty, but also market freedoms, which Americans have been socialized into thinking are the active opposition to democracy, which is why a social democratic candidate like Bernie Sanders is literally called a communist. But secondly, an attack on the faith of Americans themselves, the faith in God and the idea of in God we trust by trying to bastardize that faith, which is incredibly easily instrumentalized by members of the right wing. And this doesn't just work on the presidential level, but also in local and municipal elections where a lot of the reforms that we require can and should be enacted. This one creates a disincentive for politicians to endorse the BLM movement, to lend them support at rallies and to redirect funding, which is what they require to be able to advocate for change. But secondly, it creates a disincentive for them to adopt policies crafted by BLM, like Campaign Zero, which is actually a very good example of a policy to demilitarize the police. But if you adopt it, you get seen as associating with a movement that is actively attacking American ideals. You also don't want to adopt generally more racial equal policies because you don't want to go with the perception that you're to the BLM. Why does this matter? Because in this particular point in time, at this junction, BLM is achieving wider support and is currently escaping the label of being radical niche and anti-American. One, the, the event of the murder of George Floyd has been an incredibly visceral event of racial violence and has served as a coalescing moment for different racial and ethnic groups as evidenced by the huge outburst of happiness when Derek Chauvin got sentenced. Secondly, there's huge support in the United States of America from individuals with a large amount of influence, not calling Kaepernick taking the knee and this reaching the media, not just in the US, but outside, but also corporations co List, like Nike giving Colin Kaepernick a contract, but also redirecting their funds to the BLM movement, lending them both mainstream support and legitimacy, but also money that they need to advocate. And thirdly, outside support outside of the US, things like footballers taking a knee at the Euros, but also then making moves because they want to optically seem consistent and donating to the movement. All of these are less likely to happen at the point where we associate the movement with radical and dangerous ideas. Even if this risk is low, and I've explained why it isn't, given that we can use religion anyway, and open government doesn't have a comparative, we should not be taking this risk at this particular point. Second, and second argument. Note that BLM is an amorphous and heterogeneous movement. They rally around the idea of racial equality, the idea of blackness and fighting for the equality of blackness, which is also why they already have a coalescing identity OG. I'm not sure why they need another one. But they have different interpretations of what policy should be. Some of them want to defund the police. Some of them want to demilitarize the police. Some of them want to completely abolish the police. The reason why this is good is because, one, insofar as participating in a movement is cathartic and grants you agency insofar as you protest against something and you feel as if you have a voice, people can attach different meanings to participation in the movement and are more likely to be able to access this catharsis. But secondly, it means you can garner more support and more people on the streets, giving the visual impetus for change because different people with different ideas of what end policy should be are going to go to these rallies if there is space for them to have different interpretations. On their side of the house, you force people to abide by certain doctrines, a particular religious interpretation, and a particular ideology that stems from that. This means you exclude things like the black Muslim minority in the United States of America. You exclude young, active people. These are the individuals who are going to rally for change. These are the individuals who are most likely to go to protests, who are most likely to lobby, who are most likely to boycott, people who are active and mobile and have time on their hands. A lot of them are atheists. A lot of them have no connection to religious beliefs, nor do they want to, and they do not want to feel being put between a rock and a hard place by the movement. But third, it's just ideological differences within the movement itself, which means that Black Lives Matter is likely to alienate a large amount of people, <clears throat> it's going to take away their opportunity to find meaning and solace within the movement, but also it's less likely to garner support, which means government is less likely to get the benefits that they want to get on their side of the house. Before I move on to a principal argument, I think is also very valuable in this debate, I'm going to give closing government a chance to engage. Yeah, if it's seen as too radical, how do you think it's going to look like in the public eye, like the discourse among it? Like, how, what's it going to look like? 
I literally told you in my entire speech, this is a useless POI. Moving on to the principle. I think that the, the movement has a particular duty to be inclusive towards everyone and not tie itself to a particular ideology. Why? Because every social movement has a ventriloquist position towards its members. What does this mean? Every movement necessarily reduces the individual agency of each individual one of its members for two reasons. One, because they necessarily aggregate preferences. Insofar as they bargain collectively, they necessarily have to miss skipping loss over new ones and individual preferences of the, of the members of the movement. But secondly, insofar as the members of the movement and the members of that group at large are seen through the lens of that movement, i.e. BLM is seen as, as representing black individuals, therefore black individuals are seen through the lens of how society perceives BLM. This means that the individual agency of black individuals and black bodies is reduced insofar as BLM is the representative. This creates a duty insofar as you are representative who reduces and aggregates the agency of others and claims it's a representative to act in such a way that approximates the interests of the largest number of people within the movement, but secondly, that acts in such a way that does not reduce the agency, but actually maximize it reciprocally to the agency you took. This necessitates, therefore, principally, that you cannot take a stance which may, even if it doesn't, which may risk alienating some individuals because this breaks the duty that you have assumed towards them by claiming to be the representative. But lastly, insofar as we think connection to other social movements is a good idea, we think it becomes harder to cooperate with things like free Gaza outside of USA because there are different religious interpretations, insofar as that's a good in and of itself, but also we think that cooperation between NGOs is good. Opening opposition is clearly one this debate. Thank you very much. Thank you for that speech. I now welcome DPM. Please peer away by turning on your videos and waving. I'll take CEO. So clear it charitably. attempt to have their cake and eat it too was an attempt to get away from engaging with gender substantive because their stance was integrating with religion is really really good but we're going to arbitrarily draw the line at having black liberation theology that's impossible why because black lives matter right now is centered around liberating people from oppression and if you bring it closer and closer to theology that means that you're looking at it through a christian lens which is the definition of black liberation theology secondly though i think that this is not a debate in which we're justifying having increasing uh, connection, even though we think that would be good, but rather value judgment debate about whether it's good or bad. And I think it was always good to say what was bad. The reason why it's so harmful that they just said, we think all of this is great, but even more as bad as one, and knocks out almost all of their harms on how it's bad because it excludes people and makes them feel worse. But more importantly, because I think that it generally just makes our material just go through in the round because they agree that all of it is effective. I will still be charitable and engage with the line by line that we got from Tim though. So two main clashes on the round. First, on which side is better getting concrete change? And second of all, on the nature of the movement. So first, on change. I think both sides agree in this round that the most important actor for getting change is diminishing the, uh, the outrage and the unhappiness that white conservative people have towards the Black Lives Matter movement. The reason for this is one, because they still are the majority in white urban states, right? Rural states where violence against black people is the worst. But second of all, because they're often correlating with having more wealth, more political power, which means that even after the Black Lives Matter fades away right now, they are the ones who are going to flip back against it and make the movement more short-lived. Our mech was about how religion is uniquely effective at bridging uh, gaps and creating goodwill and solidarity for a number of reasons. The response we gave was that religion is good, that's great, OG, but second of all, that religion is bad because it actually because black liberation theology is bad because it causes more radicalization. A few responses to this. The first is, I think that their attempt to see the status quo is good, is insufficient, because I think that similar public outcries of huge joy at punishment and grief and sadness at death have happened in the past time and time again. For example, Breonna Taylor. For example, a different but analogous death, for example, uh, the, 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 um, the hurt caused to uh, 
this person assaulted by the Stanford swimmer. The bottom line, though, is that oftentimes this anger and concentration is short lived because it's motivated purely by dissatisfaction and upset. And it's really, really important that we're able to change it uh, in this motion. So the second main thing I would say is that there are concrete reasons why it is the case that even if some people in urban areas are really happy, other people are resentful. I'll take you later. And the reason for this is because I think that their own harms of radicalization are much worse on their side. Listen to their language. We want to defund and demilitarize the police. We want to lock up abusers and put them in prison. All of these are concrete attacks on the white identity, which means that they're very, very paranoid. But the second main reason why is because I actually think that radicalization does not come from what the movement itself is presenting itself as, but on how easy the stuff you're saying can be spun by Fox News and other conservative outlets. And a purely political frame is extremely easy to frame as oppositional. Um, for example, if I say this is oppressive, white people are at fault, or cops are bastards, like guys, I'm not sure how I can get worse than this, pigs, like all of that kind of thing, um, it's really, really easy to paint it as blind hate and un-Americanism. What makes Christianity and unique? And what makes bringing it closer to theology unique? It is that oftentimes it's impossible for them to criticize it in the same way. First, because I think that this is shared ground. That is, we agree on the basic principles. That is, God is good. We want to maximize worship and we, should, we want to follow his will. That means even if Fox News disagrees on the message that is said, on the, on the nuance um, of whether or not Black people are oppressed, the overall framing means that you must give the movement itself much, much more respect, but, or otherwise, you're, otherwise your viewers think of you as, as uh, uh, evil. But the second main reason why it stands out as unique is because you draw on previous figures who are already widely accepted and seen as positive. For example, the Reverend Martin Luther King. The reason why Black Lives Matter is being condemned is because they're being, like Martin Luther King is used as a positive example to make Black Lives Matter look much, much more extreme. I think for those reasons, it's actually going to be disempowering for radicals and white conservatives in order uh, if you embrace this theology. I just want to reiterate why it's the case that we are so able to diminish white conservative opposition. That is, I think we're most effective at depoliticizing this movement and changing it from something that's pretty social and grounded in modern rhetoric to something that is ideological and to do with religion and having shared and common ground. I think that's important because one, it means that people are just less oppositional and angry in the same in the way that they are automatically trying to be aggressive when and they think that the subject they're approaching is poly political, whereas in a religious context, I think that the default emotions they gravitate to are empathetic because of the experiences that they have in the past. But the second main reason we get changed is because we're also much, much better at achieving critical mass, both in terms of the amount of time and space it occupies in most Black people's lives, because yes, People currently care a lot about Black Lives Matters. However, this is often not a huge amount of time overall because campaigning aggressively for a movement is exhausting and tiring. On the other hand, making it an merging it more closely with the Black church means that it becomes something that you attend because it's part of your overall, it's like a part of your safe space. It's part of your home, um, which means that it becomes a bigger part of your identity. You're wanting to donate to it. You form closer bonds. It becomes much more common knowledge. And therefore, I think the Overton window shifts and it becomes more politically palatable as well. Before I go into the nature of movement, I'll take CJ, CO. Um, does this entire process of rebranding from less violent to more religious means that people do the bare minimum of charity instead of constantly rivaling for like reducing oppression? Does that not harm BLM in the long run? I don't think so. One, I do think that a lot of these Black pastors are extremely well read in the history of Black liberation and understand what struggle looks like. The second thing is, I think that the parallel that most closely mirrors this is the emancipation of slaves from Egypt by Moses. And I think that was a process of struggle as well. But the third thing is, I really just do think that it is the case that having collective action is a better way to implement change than having a small number of radical groups. Because I think Radical groups get alienated, they get blamed, whereas big movements are able to get political change, which is how we actually get things enshrined in stone. Finally, on the nature of the movement, I think we've explained to you why the average person is happier, because it connects to spirituality, which means you're better able to handle the grief and anger without losing hope, which is important for the long-term longevity and sustainability of the movement. The response that uh, Muslim people aren't, can't fit and atheists are alienated. Two responses. The first is there is existing ideology within the Black Lives uh, diversity and the Black church and Black Lives movement movement thing. The reason why people are able to put this aside is because they understand that they still have a very, very clear common goal, and also because the Black church has historically foregrounded inclusivity and solidarity as Black people um, and people of color before everything else. Very happy to govern.
Thank you for that speech. I now welcome the yellow. Never hear me. <clears throat> Just sorry, <clears throat> once again, can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, and POIs in chat. Cool. Three, two, one. I don't think open and government understands the context of Black Lives Matter in this motion. Black Lives Matter is by nature not doctrinally organized. Right now, if I'm a Black pastor, I can hold a Black Lives Matter event at my church, and people do. The Richmond Unitarian Church literally holds Black Lives Matter gatherings every single year but I do not need to be linked to black liberation theology to do this. I do not see liberation theology in the doctrines of Black Lives Matter, in the things that they stand for. So if I'm a gay atheist, I don't feel bad about engaging in the movement. What opening government misses is it's not just like the black Muslims and the atheists that don't engage with this. Black people today, millennials, turn out to churches at half the rate that their parents did and a quarter of the rate that their grandparents did. The stuff in the 1960s where spirituality was necessary to organize a movement is no longer true. And that is what open and government misses, that there are just so many people that are turned off by this motion or don't feel actively included in this motion that they hurt the motion writ large. Here's the problem, because as Tin identifies, if I'm an old black person in conservative South Carolina, I can already go to my church. I can feel comfort in black liberation theology. And I agree with opening government. It's true that black people who are older tend to like churches more, but they never give you a reason why those people don't like Black Lives Matter. They say, ah, oh, you don't see people turning out in conservative rural areas the way that you do in cities. Yes. Because cities have more people, they have more young people, they're more able to organize protests. All the reasons that Tin gave you answer their argument. They literally give you no reason to think that older Black individuals just don't support Black Lives Matter in the first place. And the obvious answer is they obviously do because most of them supported the civil rights movement, or like all of them supported the civil rights movement, and they still care about these same liberation teachings, even if Black Lives Matter does not actively endorse those things. Here is what the Black Liberation Theology message is that Tin points out that opening government ignores. It is one which reshapes the doctrines of BLM, and two, it is one that is actively stigmatized. That is to say, they do not understand the example when Obama went to Jeremiah Wright's church in Chicago, received sermons read, the FBI literally investigated Obama because they said, those are the teachings that are anti-American. Those are the teachings that we think are crazy. Associating with movements like that and actively imposing them in your doctrine is not only how you get more stigma but it is how you actively turn off tons and tons of other people. There are several things I want to talk about in this round. One, I want to talk about all the people that you turn off. This is millennials, this is gay people, this is conservatives, and this is even old black people. Two, I want to talk about amorphousness of the movement, why it's so important that you didn't set clear criteria and so important that you didn't have doctrines. And three, why DAPM's attempt to say we should be moderate and that's okay is actually a reasonably bad thing for the movement writ large. New substantive material on who you leave out. One, I want to talk about gay people. They're heavily stigmatized in the African-American community, largely by churches. Like Jim Clyburn, when Pete Buttigieg was running for president, literally said that Pete Buttigieg would never win in South Carolina because he would just face so much stigma for being gay. Black liberation theology often makes this worse because core components of African-American theology, the same way they said white Christianity had subverted the ability of black people to access their own forms of Christianity, said that things like homosexuality were primarily white and antithetical to black liberation. And this is terrible. The reason why young black Americans turn out against churches and accuse them of being anti-gay or misogynistic is oftentimes because they are. The counterfactual is one in which Black Lives Matter actively accepts those people right now. There is a reason why you see Pride flags and Black Lives Matter flags flown in conjunction together because the movements do care about each other, which is what Tin was talking about when he talked about why it's so important that social movements like Free Gaza, Black Lives Matter, and uh, like Gay Pride are all linked. And the problem is that right now you don't need like for B like like and, and this is the biggest thing. Even if Black Lives Matter does not actively endorse like all the terrible stances of Black liberation theology and the church, it doesn't matter. Because the problem is for Black LGBTQ plus individuals, they are more likely to feel uncomfortable when they think that there are churches that don't like the 
way that they live have closer ties between the, the, the churches and the Black Lives Matter movement. And especially right now when Black Lives Matter speaks out in favor of gay rights, it means that one of the few culturally similar communities that you have become actively less friendly to you. I think this is both a principal violation, something they never respond to on Tint's argument, and a practical violation, like, like just a massive harm as well. You're turning off a ton of people that want to be involved in the movement. Second, millennials. I, I just think there's not a real response to this other than to say, well, millennials will be fine because Black Lives Matter endorses other things. No, under your side of the motion, Black Lives Matter has to actively incorporate church teachings and liberation theology into their platform, into their organizational structure. That means folding clergy into the structure. That means talking about Bible passages. On our side, we're perfectly happy for religious people to find solace and liberation outside of Black Lives Matter. We're perfectly happy for them to organize with Black Lives Matter writ large, but the movement itself is never concretely tied to the church, and that is important. You weigh this most heavily because as Tim points out, to it we get no response. Millennials and young people are the ones that are most active in Black Lives Matter, they're the ones that go to protests. And the reason this was so important is because sizable protests created the numbers and size effect that granted Black Lives Matter legitimacy in the first place. But when Black Lives Matter, when Black, when black millennials attend church at half the rate of their parents, and there are also lots of other millennials, Asian, uh, like, like, like Asian kids, white people, Latinos, everyone that participates in Black Lives Matter protests right now, they are the ones who feel less able to participate because they're literally just not religious, or if they are, they don't fall and subscribe to the same sort of teachings, uh, the radicals or the teachings that are stigmatized as radical that opening government wants you to uh, conform to. I'll take closing if they have one. OG, quickly. Minorities are important, but they have their own movements. What's most important for Black Lives Matter is that they make their change permanent. And to do that, you need to get the buy-in of Black majorities and white people. There is no argument given from opening government why Black people do not support Black Lives Matter. Like, maybe it is true that Black people like the church a lot, but there is literally no argument to say that we need to make identity more robust. Their only argument was saying, well, identity is passable. You care about the issue of the day, but that makes no sense. Black Lives Matter has been around for 10 to 15 years because people are still impassioned by things, even if opening government says passion leads to radicalism. I'm going to say this is good. Here is why opening government stance on de-radicalizing the movement is actively bad. I think you need a large radical movement. The same way that you had Malcolm X to counter MMLK, you you need a large radical movement to force people to understand the consequences if they do not accede to the moderates. And that is why opening government is so dangerous because they disarm one of the largest and most prominent movements in support of black liberation writ large. They want to make them more moderate. They want to fold them in. Here are the responses to white conservatives. Guys, white conservatives will never care about you because in the 1960s, they said MLK was a radical socialist too. The FBI spied on him because they said his liberation theology is something that's antithetical to white people. And I just do not think they ever contradict respond to this. The last thing I want to very quickly say is that imposing on black, uh, liber black liberation theology on organizational structure and doctrines makes BLM more likely to be formally organized and organized by the clergy. But that's dangerous because the strength of BLM, as Tim points out, is in the fact that it is large and amorphous, that you can unite around different policy goals and push them at local levels without ever having formal doctrines. Very, very proud to oppose. Thank you for that speech. I now welcome member of government from the closing half to begin the debate. Cool, cool. Can you hear me? All right, perfect. All right, uh, PR is in chat, please. I'll probably take over at about five minutes. Be ready. Three, two, one. Two pieces of extraneous rebuttal, then striving straight into the extension. One, I guess specifically on uh, like Black Muslims will be excluded. Note that what they point out in terms of uh, like these are the radical things they will support is one, like redistribution, and two, like specifically love thy neighbor. These are both principles that exist in Islam, in fact, more heavily, as in we literally have compulsory redistribution. I'm not sure what aspects of specifically 
Christian ideology that is uh, that like Black Muslims will necessarily disagree with. I'm not sure if just having the label of Christianity is something that makes them disagree. Secondly, on R, we have obligations to return agency, and therefore the BLM movement has to be as inclusive as possible. I'm not sure why we can't just return agency in other ways in terms of literally any other aspect of winning this debate. I don't think that principle necessarily matters over here. Specifically getting into our arguments. Firstly, on why specifically individual change happens when the discourse changes around what specific, whether or not to support BLM on the specific things they stand for. And then secondly, why specifically political change happens. And third, why some level of radicalization is good. First, why, uh, why does individual change happen? One, O paints one specific image of what uh, liberation theology looks like. I think the way it is in the minds of most Americans is specifically historical, right? In the sense of literally assisting in civil rights movements, literally in assistance of MLK. I'm unsure of why necessarily you brand yourself in particular to specific movements that they necessarily point out. I think the greater association when adopted by BLM is likely to be because that just sounds like it's more strategic, the more true opening opposition is is specifically to be in terms of just continuing the line in terms of what's literally stopped slavery. I think that's particularly persuasive. Second, and probably more importantly, is this changes how discourse happens, especially in conservative spaces. Particular example being just like Fox News debates. In particular, because they specifically stand for things like Christian ideology, in current status quo, the reason why people aren't will is, are willing to live in some level of cognitive dissonance, where you specifically have moral pushes from the Bible in terms of supporting very specific BLM movement, right? As in, if your neighbor is literally being murdered by the state, maybe you should intervene to some level, why you should be giving charity, etc. There's a limitation to the morphing that you can do off those moral frameworks in the first place. The reason why it works is because they don't ever need to actually engage with the debate. People tell them that BLM is anti-Christian, that Christian values don't align with this, and they're willing to accept that regardless of what external argumentation takes place. We change this in a few key facets. Notice this is different from opening government. Firstly, we have specifically things like priests being called out, uh, called on. Few important things here. They say opening opposition's strongest push against this is us will be seen as a bastardization of Christianity. I'm unsure of why this happens. If necessarily one, black priests are already respected members of the community. So like in like the American, like, like especially like the American rights mind, right? Like priests are the ultimate like pinnacle in terms of like religious authority. Like they, you, they listen to their own generally and unless being like very explicitly racist as an odd, they're specifically a black priest. It feels unlikely that they're going to reject them off the bat without at the very least considering what they specifically have to say. Second, specifically now the argumentation that takes place is within religious framework, as in it is quoting Bible verses, etc. As in you are forced to some extent to engage with the ideas in the first place rather than rejecting outright. Understand just saying this is already a probabilistically more determinant outcome in terms of changing your morals or specifically support, but also specifically why just like the Bible is more likely to be supportive of a BLM rather than not supportive in terms of like the own like specific morphing mechanisms that opening opposition has given as in the true verses in the Bible are probably more closely aligned to BLM. Importantly, what both of these things mean is that you have some level of internal consideration as is truly the right thing as in you have that internal dialogue, as in what is true to follow and what is not. You can no longer outright reject it, which specifically means that you have some basis or to connect with specifically these arguments and have some level of consideration, which takes place within Republican spaces themselves, within right-wing spaces themselves. Third, you can co-op church structures. Importantly, the church ideology is really useful in terms of doing things like recruitment, doing things like getting people out to rallies, doing things like specifically messaging out and using moral arguments in order to convince people of what is right and specifically the people you are trying to convince are already uh, are already affected by these moral argumentations because that's why they donate to the church that's why they buy into the entirety of like the church ecosystem etc importantly you're co-opting these structures and using them in a very similar way as these are literally the most effective tactics against the people who are strongly against your opening opposition go Churches already support Black Lives Matter behind the scenes. Gov needed to defend that BLM returns that favor by integrating clergy members into voting, the media presence, and protest organizations, which is especially dangerous given the scale of stigma conservative media. Sorry, has that's 15 placed. seconds. Sorry. 
Okay, importantly, a few things. One, having integration with BLM means that now Fox News has to call them on in terms of discussions of BLM. There's a reason why Fox News doesn't call on black priests because one, they don't want to, uh, because they're just not associated with BLM initially, right? They might occasionally give supporting statements. That means they're not integral as part of BLM, as in this is why specifically you necessarily call them on. Secondly, and I guess like political change deals with this more specifically. Uh, why necessarily, uh, uh, and also, like Fox News tends to like have room to anyway. Uh, specifically, one Republicans can't refuse a church, as in, like it is seen as incredibly authority. Uh, it, it is seen as an important authority. You don't outright reject them. You have to have very good reasons in order to do so. Secondly, your capacity to lobby, as in churches specifically have personal relations with things like politicians, with th uh, like things specifically within the U.S. ecosystem, which specifically means. Um, that you need to co-op BLM in order to be able to specifically use those things. And third, more important, uh, and third, finally, if it is true that, uh, so now you specifically do have specific stances you have to stand for. I think Tin is right in pointing that out, but I don't think points out the flip side of that. As in, if you currently represent yourself as part of BLM, every time you have to clarify that you don't stand for the most extreme of stances. You have to clarify like 50 different things about BLM that you do stand for and that you don't stand for. I think this is just harder to do. I think you can stand for parts of a movement, like political, like not everyone stands for every single policy of the Democratic Party, but still votes for them and goes out and campaigns for them. Importantly, you can do this similarly for BLM, but I think more importantly, what you're able to do is have a more fixed stance and have more fixed ID, uh, personality in, so that you don't have to like argue like a few different things at once. Cool. Thank you for that speech. I now welcome member of opposition. All right, uh, I just want to check, is the debate being streamed or like yeah, recorded. I don't think so. Um, yeah. Well, I think it is. Have some observers. Oh. Yeah. You have some observers. Uh, no, I think it is being recorded and streamed. Yeah. I, I think matter. we get the recorded like button. If it was, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. No, it's being streamed. All right, cool, cool, cool. So I'll be a bit more cautious about what I say. <laughs> All right, it's, it's no All right, um, starting in three, two, one. Panel, there's a fundamental disconnect between what government bench is trying to achieve and how they're trying to achieve this. Because presumably what CG is trying to say is that you send preachers to Fox News debates and they convince which group exactly? Do you convince white Christians that they should support the black liberation cause and they should join the BLM? Because presumably most black people at least tacitly support BLM. None of the government teams have shown any reasons why there is a massive group of black people who currently don't support the BLM and will support the BLM once you ignore that like black church. I'm unsure what precise benefit they're trying to chase from this. Why will they not convince white Christians and why will they make it worse? Because white church vehemently oppose black churches politicizing Christianity in order to like gain political points for BLM because they see this as a political weaponization of their religion which they see as sacred. Evangelicals have already had lots of tension with black churches. The reason for that most of these white congregations have a lot of racist people, have a lot of conservative people who don't like the black cause. Therefore these churches and these preachers in order to appeal to their own congregations need to defend against the politicization of of their religion in order to liberate black people. Popular televangelists want to stay away from these politicization because they fear losing tax benefits, etc. because now you're like getting Christianity in collision with government structures because BLM is trying to take down a lot of government structures. You get increased tensions among Christians of different races. And we say that it is worse because you ignite a lot of latent hatred that some white Christians and some evangelicals might have against black people. We tell you, you make it far worse that you incite this racist tensions. Now, the major three issue in this debate in the opening half has largely been about increasing supporter and political capital. And I just want to weigh in on this and clarify why 
opposition clearly wins this issue and specifically from closing opposition. Now, who are these black churchgoers? Presumably, they're generally poor or lower middle class people who don't have a lot of like a strong socioeconomic status. Most black churches are seriously socially conservative, even more socially conservative than Republicans and then white Christians because of like how these congregations evolved in the past. They have often like supported conservative politicians, like funded them, and etc. OG says that these churches are becoming more inclusive now in a response to the POI that Wafi asked them. And this is a massive concession. What did they concede to when they say churches are liberalizing? They concede to the massive demographic shift that has taken place over the last 60 years. You have less and less people who identify as religious today. More and more people associate a sort of negative sense with religiosity due to things such as terrorism, such as Christians attacking synagogues, etc., and greater liberalization and greater education and greater socioeconomic development of the society as a whole. The conclusion is you cannot do what MLK did because the society is no longer the same. The need for spiritual involvement in a movement no longer exists in a way that it did exist in the past. But whose support do you lose out on? And this is crucial because opening opposition kind of highlights the pride movement, LGBTQ feminist movement. There's relevant, but more relevant is people who see Christianity as a cause for black oppression. And this forms a huge number of people who predominantly feel like Christianity is the reason why blacks are oppressed in America to begin with, because Bible was used in the past to justify slavery and colonialism. Colonialism spread because they wanted to spread the word of God and they wanted to quote, civilize black people, which like they justified the invasion and all of the harm and all of the atrocious things they did by claiming that Bible gave them a divine right to do so. This is especially relevant for America because we saw an exodus of black people leaving Christianity in the 1950s, 70s, 80s. Why did that happen? Because many people realized that Christianity was the core of their oppression and black churches were complicit within it. People like Wallace Farad Muhammad, people like Malcolm X, people like Muhammad Ali left Christianity for Islam because they felt Islam was a more egalitarian religion. Therefore, once you bring in Christianity at the center stage of your movement, you essentially alienate all of those Muslim activists who are really vocal. You also alienate a huge number of liberals and a huge number of agnostics and atheists who also see Christianity as the fundamental cause of black oppression. Second, you lose support from a lot of corporations. Corporations side with liberals today. Delta and Coca-Cola in Georgia essentially like, like moved out of Georgia because like conservatives did some shit with voter like registration. Why? Because liberals spend more and they own more capital. You also see sports teams, etc., do this. When you essentially merge religion with Black Lives Matter in a manner that they're inseparable from one another, you also lose out on a lot of corporate funding because corporations know funding a movement that is strongly associated with religion will be largely seen as illiberal and it won't help their consumer base who are presumably liberal. So even for virtue signaling, corporations are unlikely to fund these movements or support the causes or give like some sort of tokenistic representation that they do right now. Before that, like open government. Well, I get that so many times, but none of our cases would have a massive untapped well of black support. Rather, we replace open aggression for worst whites with ambiguity and pass a black support to active. Do better than your opening, engage. So uh, if your appeal is that you make the movement more peaceful and you make the movement safer, we tell you that it is worse because oftentimes BLM has succeeded because of its violent threat, because it has been portrayed as a movement that actively carries a threat. Violence works because of its shock value and it's hard to ignore. The case in point, the George Floyd murder had a lot of looting, had a lot of violence in the aftermath of it, which created a cost to the capitalists, which created a need for capitalists to listen to their demand. Why is this crucial? Because you get less money on their side of the house. Even if you get more like black Christians, they're presumably poor and they'll at best donate some amount to your charities, etc. You lose out on richer, politically savvy and more influential people. Their support is making changes right now. They are the ones funding lawsuits on BLM people representing them. They're the ones who are more politically relevant and vote more often. And because a lot of black Christians don't really vote because of voter suppression laws and because they're not that politically active in general. We tell you that these supporters that you lose out on 
are far more important. Most importantly, BLM is getting things done right now. You have more body cameras on police, you have more scrutiny, you have more convictions, you have more awareness, you have more political relevance as BLM. I don't understand what is the need for this, given that BLM is on a trend to succeed. BLM is more relevant in places such as New York and California in blue states where churches have less power and like more black people exist in those states. Their support adds very little, but puts disproportionate number of liberal voters in those states away. You can't get anything done in red states where you will not like you'll be met with heavy resistance from white Christians who are the majority in those states. So create a better safe space in places where they already have some support structure, such as New York and California, where we don't think churches are that relevant, extremely proud to oppose. Thank you for that speech. I now welcome government whip. Am I audible? Could you be slightly louder if possible? Uh, is this better? Much better, go for it. Okay, brilliant. Starting in three, two, one, three broad things in this speech. Firstly, talking about the unity of black people within the movement. Secondly, talking about changing the rest of the population and lastly, on political change and palatability. Firstly, talking about like generally on how, like how the unity works. I would just posit that this is one, something that is generally irrelevant within this, like within this movement. I don't think that the main problem of BLM is that black people and are like turning out onto the streets enough. I would just posit that the main problems of it is actually achieving political change. And this is the reason, and like, achieving the change in people who aren't already supporting the movement. And this is why the focus of Arif's extension was action on all of those things. But let's go through the things that are, like the rest of the teams want to tell you about it. OO says, and like both OO and CO say that like, ah, you're going to alienate the atheists and the queer people. I would just posit that one, if you are based on these same beliefs, i.e. we need to do something against the massive oppression that is happening, that is something that is a relatively transferable understanding. Like Arif said, it is also present in other, for example, understandings or like other religions. So I don't think you're alienating any people people about that as given this idea about liberation is something that's fundamentally transferable. Secondly, I don't think so that like BLM is now fundamentally unable to dictate anything that the churches are saying. I don't think that they're going to platform the most homophobic statements made by churches. Unclear if that's even the status quo in black churches right now, just asserted by opening opposition. At that point, I think you are going to be able to show that given that the, probably all of the queer people in America are also going to know that like America is fundamentally always going to be a society where religion is at, at a high place. I think that they're rather it's rather a positive thing that there is a church on their side supporting very explicitly their movements, giving out their resources and like fighting for them publicly in the name of the movement. Rather, they're going to feel disheartened that no, this is something that is going to oppose them. At that point, I think that all those contentions about, ah, oh, there is no unity is something that is not going to work. At that point, at which probably black identity and the oppression you feel every single day within the American society is something that is presumably more important to you. Seals tries to go, but like, ah, oh, Christianity is the cause of black suffering. I would just posit that probably the black churches are ones that are explicitly going against this, have historically gone against this, like Arif tells you. And at those points in time, that is not something that is associated with the type of like, with the type of oppression and suffering that historically been associated with Christianity. If the black church is able to dis like disengage from that, I would also just think that this is something that like the people are also able to perceive. I don't think that black people are just willingly going to a church that they feel is going to oppress them. I think that's unlikely. I think that's a mischaracterization by, from like CO. At that point, I think it's genuinely unclear clear if you're going to lose any type of unity within the black movement. Now let's talk about like changing other people. And like firstly, on how we are beating opening government. The main line that opening government wants to tell is like we're giving you a common moral framework and like we're getting buy-in in religious areas. Firstly, I would just posit that opening government never tells me exactly why just appealing to religion is something that is enough in generally to like change the minds of people. I think that probably there's lots of like you can appeal to religion in many ways, like for, for, but there are probably lots of white Christians who are against immigrants from Middle East on, on grounds of religion. Opening government never makes the explicit like, like analysis as to what is the thing that changes 
is the understanding of those people that just say, ah, exposure, common moral grounds, unclear what that is likely going to be the case. What Arif specifically does is he tells you the link as to how now you get to see the arguments as you are forced to think about them at a point in which they are getting platformed on things like Fox News that are channels that are already being accessible to you. I think that this is something that is likely going to happen and at a point at which probably, like if you if both op teams are correct, that like, look, ah, oh, this is a narrative that goes against the fundamental beliefs that Bible tells us, at that point, probably white Christians are going to want to defend their religion and want to engage in those arguments in order to prove that uh, they are correct. At that point, this is where all of those discussions are going to be happening, and this is where you get to platform those arguments. I would just posit that probably at a point in which you are like going to have things like 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 churches, like I don't know, saying like fighting against each other, like like a CEO wants to tell you. I think at that point you're still going to get like things like people individually buying into the arguments that you're able to see on the screens and all of those things. I think that that is the thing that we're specifically telling you how you're able to overcome the opening government that has. The second line that OG has is they're like, look, we could do this change through critical mass. I think OO is correct in pointing out that these are all the things you're able to get at a point at which the churches are just promoting BLM on their own. Our analysis is significantly more specific to the idea that you need to incorporate BLM, uh, you need to incorporate churches on the level of BLM. This is the thing that gives you the possibility to actually do things like co-op church structures. Why else would they do things like, I don't know, make campaigns for BLM publicly if they don't get any support back from BLM? Why else would they be the people that are invited on Fox News if, if BLM isn't platforming all of those people? I think on that point, that is the way in which we do it. This is also the reason why Arif's analysis on things like, ah, appealing to historical values is something that works. The, the, like white Christians aren't going to think that like our black churches helped in like doing civil rights movements or for example, were against slavery. But at a point at which BLM is the one platforming them, they are forced to confront that idea. At a point at which you cannot just say, and it's decidedly completely unacceptable to say that like civil rights movement was a bad thing that happened in the history of America. At that point, you're forced to already conform and understand and agree to some of the things the black church is doing. This is the point where we're able to change the mindsets of those people. Oh says that like you're going to oppose the, or CEO says they're going to oppose using religion for those movements. Like, first of all, opening opposition says something completely different and that all of the churches already like and do it. I think CEO is knifing with that analysis. Secondly, white people also fucking do it. Like, look at the way abortion is like, like go like pro, pro, I don't know, fucking pro not choice is like done in like American, uh, in American choices that is like using like co-opting religious understandings. Unclear why this is analysis that is true. I think at a point at which there is disagreement, that is the point at which you're able to get those people onto those platforms and talk about this. I, at, at that point, I think we're the only team that shows you how you're able to get meaningful change within the hearts of people. Before I move on, oh, oh. There is no sense in trying to convince conservative Fox News viewers by platforming creatures. You run the risk of turning off lots and lots of people. Even if you mitigate all of our harms, you literally get no benefits because the guys that watch Fox News are never going to care what Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson talk about. I mean, I would just posit that this is the only way you're probably ever going to reach those people. Like at a point at which Republicans are consistently vetoing those bills, the thing you're crucially needing is that they're no longer vetoing. Even if we don't get them to come out to the fucking rallies, we're getting those people to not tell to their senators that you need to veto every single bill that the PLM is trying to achieve. Last thing, let's talk about palatability. OO says that like, ah, this like movement or like this nar narrative is something that is unpalatable and toxic and really, really bad. One, Tin just asserts this. Like I have no clue if this is something that is actually true. Don't don't just buy it because he says it. At that point, I think it's much more likely that probably the BLM isn't going to be centering things that are already being fundamentally Marxist if everyone knows that this is a bad thing. But even if Tin is correct that this is the narrative that every single American somehow knows that is about black liberation, at that point, I would just also posit that having things like being the BLM movement, being radical is something that is naturally good for political change. The reason why you were able to get convictions for the person that, my, that murdered George Floyd is the reason because the movement called for so many more things, like we need to defund the police. You're moving the overton window at a point at which you're claiming for more things and now doing that conviction was the least the social justice system was able to do. I think that's not a bad thing. We are winning in CG. Thank you for that speech. I now welcome opposition web. Hi, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, you're audible. All right, cool. Um, is the chair disconnected? No, 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 I'm here. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. Cool, cool. All right. 
starting in three, two, one. I'm going to talk about two things in my speech. The first is the change that is suggested from Gov's side and whether or not that actually happens. Here, I'm going to extraneously engage with both closing and opening government. Second, I'm going to talk about the sustainability of the movement and why that happens better on our side of the house. First, let's try and actually understand for once the change that both the Gov teams are suggesting because they've been like very fucking ambiguous here quite intentionally because I don't think they know really what they want. So here, what we can assume they want is that ultimately they want to create some sort of common ground, which was a major line that opening government says that you, they want to create a more welcoming narrative to more people and going to do some rebranding. Closing government says they're going to engage in discussions because you ultimately challenge their entire definition of what religion asks them to do. The first thing that I'm going to say is that there is no common ground here. Breaking down both opening and closing government's material, the people are going to engage because there's common ground. Look, Sabit's entire analysis was how black and white churches fundamentally differ from one another based on what their congregation wants. Insofar as that is true, vast majority of black churches themselves are fundamentally opposed by white churches, white politicians, and the vast majority of white conservative people. If your entire mechanism of change relies on convincing white conservative people that you require rights, I don't think that necessarily succeeds because this, these people will disproportionately always listen to their own congregation. Why will we never get white uh, the support from white churches, even if we go for like uh, the ideology where you want to go for liberate thy neighbor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Few fundamental reasons under this. The first is that these people will always go like these churches will always do what their own congregation wants. Going for something that says that black people deserve more rights or that white people should acknowledge their own privilege often goes against the fundamentals of what their own congregation supports. Often this means you get less donations, less funding, etc., or less people coming to your church. This means white churches have a fundamental reason to never engage in this discussion to begin with, which means that often the discussion then becomes about which religious interpretation is true, automatically breaking down, closing government's entire mechanism that white churches will now engage and like suddenly get convinced because, ah, yes, God said so. But if you're fundamentally against what God said, I don't think that mechanism of change really is efficacious. But secondly, I think this worsens the situation for BLM because now they're not just seen as a party, they're, they're not just seen as a protest group that loots stores, but they're also seen as a, uh, as a protest group that destroys religion and the interpretation of it. I think that's actually worse because this further alienate, alienates them from those very supporters that you want to change. But finally, I think these white churches are also very closely linked to their politicians. Ultimately, this means these politicians also have to cater to white voter bases. This ultimately means your main support group cannot be the conservative voter blogs that you ultimately want to change. Why is this an extremely important argument in this debate? Because our counterfactual is that you automatically always make sure that liberals are your top priority. And this is where we differentiate from opening opposition, who just spend a, like, a little time talking about why homosexuals will be alienated by the church. Our idea is not just homosexuals in general, but liberals in total who ultimately disassociate from religion day by day. Sadiq tells you how there's a literal need for, there is no longer a need for you to align with the spiritual needs of the movement Etc., which is why you see less religious involvement, which is why you see vast majority of allies al al providing allyship to BLM are being like less religious or liberal groups. Ultimately, this means you get more intersectional support and you get more liberals. Ultimately, this also means you get more corporate endorsement because the, they want to be the corporations that align with people in New York City or California who are vast majority liberal, who don't give a shit about what Fox News says. So ultimately, they aren't reliant. Why is this the most important voter base? Because look, according to opening government's own um, me mechanism and own judging metric of sustainability, you get less people on their side of the house because less liberals show up. And ultimately, if these conservatives are not convinced by your religious argument, you will lose them as well. And we think this is fundamentally problematic. But second, I think this entire mechanism of opening government that you want to rebrand yourself is, I think, even more problematic. Because now what you're asking is like you're losing out your unique selling point of being that violent movement. Sadi tells you multiple changes that the Black Lives Matter has managed to do by being the violent movement, that they've scared, made politicians scared shitless, that they've threatened them and like ultimately have gotten individuals like Derek Chauvin in jail. Ultimately, this means this rebranding can be framed as a win for the other side where you can show them that ultimately we've managed to defeat the Black Lives Matter movement. Ultimately, this harms their overall sustainability and ultimately you lose a vast majority of liberals who side 
sided with you simply because of how violent you are. All of these reasons mean closing opposition managers to prove to you that liberal voter bases are your most important stakeholders in this particular idea, but ultimately your rebranding process loses out. So even in opening government's absolute best case where you rebrand yourself, that is actually more harmful in the long run by their own metric of sustainability because these conservatives won't continue to show up for movements. They will just donate a meager amount of charity because it is the Christian thing to do. And that is literally the best case for their side because you acknowledge them to be humans, but you don't acknowledge things like white privilege. We would rather the conversation doesn't happen on religious metrics like closing government wants and rather happens on the basis of what these things are. And that is where I want to move on to flagging our extensions, but before that, opening government. 90% of your case hangs on a fact claim about churches, which is incredibly wrong. Legitimacy enjoyed by black churches because of MLK is why leaders from Bernie to Clinton to Trump advertise their relationship with black churches during their presidential campaigns. Okay, first off, I've just given you multiple reasons why even in your best case, if you succeed in siding with black churches, that's still not enough to like convince the vast majority of people directly implicit for race, di uh, directly uh, who are accomplices of carrying out racism, wh which is like white conservative people. But second, how that automatically like alienates your liberal voter bases, which means ultimately, even if past presidents have shown support, the vast majority of liberals fundamentally oppose the teachings of black churches. And ultimately, insofar as you've show no mechanism as to why black church will suddenly change other than asserting that the church is suddenly oh so fucking wholesome i don't think that counts as a fucking mechanism now let's talk about our extension we've shown you why number one ultimately on our side of the house these black churches were the fundamental root cause of oppression that is perceived by the vast majority of people often this means that more and more people can leave uh, more and more people can leave your movement and stop aligning with you this is bad for sustainability because ultimately you lose corporate sponsorship who did so because of virtue signaling, you lose your biggest voter base who'd show up for protest time and time again. What you're left with in Gov's absolute best case are people who donate every once in a while because it is the Christian thing to do. People who believe you should be given some help because God sent you in this life. On our side, the calls are far more ballsy. You ask for more rights, you attack white privilege, and you get actual shit done as there is a trend right now. On your side, you lose all that, you lose your biggest supporter base, and you lose what made you BLM. For all of those reasons, proud to oppose. Thank you for that speech and for that great bit. Uh, I think now you'll have to leave this room so we can do deliberation here. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm, I don't know who audio visual this, and I think we're supposed it's all come, but they're the ones doing the stream, so we should make sure that the stream has been cut before we deliberate. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, um, if audio visuals or, or com can leave the chat, that would be great, so we can continue deliberation. Mm. I have messaged um, uh, all com. <laughs> 